Thank you very much, James. That is my job title. I am presently the, um, the Royal Academy of Engineering's Research Chair in Additive Manufacturing, and that's co-sponsored by GK and Aerospace at Filton. Um, so what I was going to talk to you today about is what we're attempting to do when we make an object by AM. Hopefully, we want to make a part that has, now I'm a metallurgist, right, so I'm going to show lots of metallurgy things, so I do apologize, but if you, if you can ask me at the end if you don't understand any of the bits, or if you do, just get, fall asleep, and um, we'll, we'll meet up later anyway. So, microstructure and properties. We want to produce the microstructure that is suitable for application. We would like to have a microstructure that is going to be useful when we put it into, uh, when we employ it. We want to have the form that is right, which is not always guaranteed. We can draw it, you can print it, sort of, but do you always get the shape that you think you're going to get? And the answer is, some of the time, of course, no, we don't. We also want it to have high integrity. We want to make sure that there's no holes in it, which, again, is something we have to work on. We also want to have good process definition and control. If we can define the process and we can, we can understand what the different parameters do on our process, we can apply a bit of control to it and we can exercise that control to influence the structure and the microstructure that we get. And when we get all of that right, we get this. We get performance on demand. So that's what we're after. We want to dial in a series of properties. We want to put the material into this machine and we want to get performance on demand. We want that. Because if we're not going to compete on that basis, additive manufacturing has a very difficult job, in some cases, getting the attention that it deserves in companies, in the sense of a company using it. So, looking at the alloys that we've got, we can work with the current alloys that we have, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we might alter the process to allow us to do that. We're going to look with the current process and think about how we might alter the alloys to allow the current process as it stands to, be, to, to deal with difficult to process materials. And then the last one, I'm going to alter the process and the alloys and just see what we get. And it isn't a mess, by the way. So, question that we often get asked, can we use current alloys if we modify the process? Can we use current alloys on this, pro in, inside of this machine? The answer is yes, of course you can. But the first thing you've got to do is understand if you're being fair to the material that you're putting in. Now, materials have all sorts of physical properties. They have melting points. They have coefficients of thermal expansion. They have all sorts of things like this. And we can be tremendously unfair to them if we just put them in and press go. So what we want to do is we want to maybe understand what some of these strange terms like contour and hatch and hatch offset, we want to understand what they all mean. And essentially, what they mean is and this is an RCAM, by the way, this is for an RCAM. This is a speed function, which gives you beam velocity, beam current, and therefore, effectively, the amount of energy you're putting in per unit volume. And when you sit back and you work out what do all of these fancy little controls that we're, we're allowed to change, what do they do? Well, they basically, they influence the amount of energy that we're dumping into our material per unit volume, per unit time. So we're influencing only the heat going in. And the material will respond to that. So you're putting powdered material in, and we're looking to see what the, strategy, what the melt strategy will do. Well, this is, a, this is using standard settings, and this is a piece of work that's been done by one of my PhD students, who's now a postdoc, uh, Sam Thomas Williams. And he, it was done between myself and uh, Phil Prangnell at Manchester. And what we did was we took standard settings, and we looked to see what kind of defects we had left in our part if we just did standard settings and we just used the machine as we were told to out of the box. And what Sam found is on the top one there, that's all of the defects you find. Now, that looks really alarming, right? But that is, a, that is quite a deep, a deep section of material, and that is the XCT projection. So that's the computer tomography projection of every single defect onto that small plane there. The volume fraction of these, of these uh, pores is less than 0.2%. Okay, so don't be alarmed by what you see. Our eyes are always drawn to multicolored objects. Okay, but at the top, that's all the defects. At the bottom, these are the defects that we think are related to uh, lack of fusion, and the blue defects there are the ones that we think are related to our pores in our material. Now, does it matter that we have these defects in there? Well, of course it does, because defects drive are the initiation site for failure. 
and we find that we have, can have very small defects and we can get very big cracks. And the kind of ones that we see, we sometimes have this one is a small version of that one. And that one is caused by coalescence of lots of those. And we know they coalesce because we occasionally saw them coalescing. So those are defects that are related to the gas porosity that's present in the powders that we put into the machine in the first place. The other defects are caused by lack of fusion, which are these little red splashes here. So those red splashes are actually relatively rare, but those blue ones and those purple ones, they're relatively common. So being a university and full of bright uh, men and women who want to actually go out and find how things work, what Sam did was he went away and he switched everything off in a systematic way to see if he could influence what the outcome from the machine would be. And if we go across here, that's the standard settings, and we tried all sorts of different things. But B, the second one along, is the one I would like you to look at. All we did there, we switched every single bit of physics off inside of our RCAM, and we just went around and we drew a line using an electron beam. Doing that, we managed to both reduce the amount of porosity that we had from gas, and also to improve the general integrity of the component that we had. So he, he went, that was, that was what he was after. Interestingly, it speeds the process up as well, and interestingly, it also allows us to control our shape better, because by making the modification, this is work that was done by Sam and another one of my PhD students, Chris Smith, they went and changed and modified the structure, and this is an unsupported structure, and they managed to make the unsupported structure go from that, which is the, on the left-hand side, which is the standard, to that on the right, which is what you get if you employ uh, if you use non-standard uh, non scan strategies. And the key variable for us was this energy density. How much energy are we putting into the material per unit time or per unit volume? And if you play around with that and you spend a long time thinking about it, you can come up with something that looks like this. And this is a normalized process map that was done by one of my postdocs, uh, Myrig Thomas. And it takes, on there we have Inconel, we've got CM247, we've got TIE64, we've got stainless steel, we've got a nonsense alloy on the bottom that we made up in the lab. And all of them show that you can make, if you set your process parameters right, to give you the right level of energy input per unit volume for the material parameters and match them, then you get a well, you get a very high integrity part out the far end with very good mechanical properties. So, if we understand what we're doing, we can start to change the parameter set to allow us to put any material on there that we want and have a fighting chance of getting a high integrity component out. So once we understand that, the next logical step is to say, is there a way of developing a new material to work on powder bed AM? Now, this is work that uh, I stood up here a very long time ago and talked about this exact thing. I, I'm not going to put the eggs analogy up, you'll be glad to know, Rob. But um, this is me, obviously, in the lab, sorting out how to make alloys. Well, obviously it isn't, it's Tony Stark, but this is, our, this is the aim. This is what we would like to do as metallurgists. We would like to be able to identify the different alloys that we want, bring them all together, and make this new magic material that we're going to get great properties out of. But to do that, we have to understand what the process is actually doing and why the material is responding the way it is. And we've got conductivity, absorptivity, which is very important if we're playing around with lasers and electron beams. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. We've got a melting point, and we therefore have a, and we have a specific heat capacity. We have to put enough energy in to get this up to its melting point. And that is really our challenge. Highly conductive materials can get very small melt pools. And very small melt pools lose energy very quickly. Material with low absorptivity can have a smaller pool and your coupling efficiency is lower. Higher melting point alloys obviously require more energy to melt. So these are, uh, these are what's called um, Ashby maps. These are, these are uh, property diagrams. And absorptivity is the amount of, amount of energy that's absorbed by your material when you shine a laser of a specific wavelength at it. It's related to the resistivity of that material. Okay? And there's a very specific function that you can work through to work out what this is. And along there, you can see the melting point. Now, if we start to play around with it, you can actually see that thermal conductivity, which is also related to your electrons and your absor absorptivity, are inversely correlated with each other. 
So it's really nice. You can, it won't absorb very much energy, but it will remove it very, very quickly, is what that says. So if you choose something like aluminium, and aluminium is a very popular choice for people to come and say, can we use aluminium on your, on your uh, systems? It's got the worst of both worlds. You can heat it up, but it requires a lot of energy. And when you do heat it up, it'll conduct it away. So I'll just skip that one. This is another one about residual stress. Residual stress is a great challenge for us. We generate a lot of residual stress. And um, Rob definitely came up with it inside of his work as his PhD. He came up with this mapping out of a shock resistance parameter and a dimensional stability parameter. And the nicest material that we could think of at the time was INVAR. It's a very low expansion material. So it doesn't, it doesn't expand or contract very much um, when you heat it up. And therefore, it's incredibly dimensionally stable. And it's very thermally shock resistant because there's no strain induced when you warm it up. And uh, he came up with a, a design rule for it, which was relating sort of absorptivity and stress. And we published this um, in the iron and steel making, asked us to give him a comment on what steels might be useful for, for um, additive manufacturing. And so we gave them that. And it was, it was quite a nice thing to be asked to do, to be honest. Uh, the steel, steel industry is pondering over this quite intensely. But just to go back to aluminium, right, this, what you can do is, if we're thinking about how might we make an alloy suitable for the process, you've got to look to see if there's some exploitable phenomena that we can employ. Because sometimes we, the, it's there in front of our noses and we haven't sat back and looked at it and thought, I wonder how we could make this work. And in this one, uh, what we did was a, bit of, a nice bit of work with uh, one of our students, Pratik Vora. It was one that uh, Neil Hopkinson, Cameron Mumtaz and I had. And going back to that, Normally, what you do when you've got an AM part, you anchor it to a surface. We kind of didn't want to anchor it. And we were just thinking about what would you do if you didn't want to put any support structures in there? What might you try to do? And the idea that we came up with, well, this is what it looks like if you do it without supports. So it warps and bends and pulls up and does all sorts of horrible things and cracks and everything. What we thought we might do is we might use something that's first year metallurgy. So first week, first year, in fact, students are probably learning it now back at base, is this is a phase diagram. And when you mix two materials together, you can have a high and a low melting point material. And you, mix, you can melt the low melting point material. It will dissolve your high melting point material into it. And it can generate a alloy with a lower freezing point than the one that you started with. So what we decided to do was to exploit that particular phenomena to make an in situ alloy by mixing pure aluminium and pure silicon. It's not a very exciting alloy. It's quite a basic one. But it forms the basis for most of the aluminium silicon casting alloys that we would like to employ. What happens is you have your, you have your mixture. You melt your aluminium. The aluminium dissolves your silicon, a bit like, sugar, like the sugar into your tea. And then when it drops below, when, it's, when it comes to equilibrium, local equilibrium with itself, it will freeze off because you're holding the bed temperature at a temperature that is, a, that is below the, melt, the freezing point of that final liquid. But it has a long freezing range, which means that as it's freezing very, very slowly and you're holding the bed at high temperature, all of the strain energy that's starting to come in as it freezes and forms a coherent network and starts to pull, starts to contract, all of that gets dissipated. So the energy is expended over a long time and you end up with a stress-free component. And when you do it properly, you can make unsupported overhangs that look like that. Yes, it's not pretty. You know, we're not going to go out and commercialize it tomorrow. But this is a PhD. This is about proof of concept. This is about taking an idea and seeing where it goes. That spring is really nice. Looks a bit wonky, but everyone had been doing that for about half an hour on it before he took a photo. So alter process and chemistry. And this is really is the last one. Okay. But this is something that um, a PhD student who's just finishing in mine, who's been working with LPW to design alloys for the machine, or for the process. Nickel super alloys, everyone wants them. Very popular material. Lovely complex structures, lovely complex shapes. Absolute nightmare to process. They crack like crazy. Okay. They have all sorts of issues with them, but they're great. And these are very high value materials. If you can get the right form, you're away. So the problem with this, though, is back to our thermal stress. 
And what we can set up in a part as we're putting it into the system as we currently run them now, where they run quite cold, even 80 degrees is cold. We're talking about thermodynamic temperatures here. When you run it quite cold, what you're doing is you're just generating and storing stress. And the kind of stresses you can get are from plus 800 to minus 800 MPa. Now, that's very, very close to the failure stress at temperature of some of these materials. So what, what, what might you want to do? Well, you might want to come up with a parameter that tells you what your crack susceptibility is. So that's what Neil's developed. That's your UTS divided by your strength at a particular temperature. That's your UTS and your thermal stress. You look at that ratio. And we want to actually set that to be greater than 1, which is maybe a fairly simplistic parameter. But what could we do to do that? Well, one of the things you're looking at there, how do you improve the UTS of an alloy? How do you improve its ultimate tensile strength without going away and inventing an entirely new one? Well, the interesting thing is that the process that we're using, additive manufacturing, uses a moving high-intensity heat source. High-intensity heat sources moved that are very, very focused, and the well-pool duration is very, very short. It's effectively what is called a rapid solidification process. If you move that beam around fast enough, you can solute trap. You can trap all of, those all of the elements that you've got in your material in the lattice of the alloy, and you can strengthen the lattice by just trapping them there. It's hugely, hugely metastable. If you breathe on it too hard, it will start to transform. But you can exploit that phenomena to allow you to get crack-free parts in your machine. And what he did was he went away and he proved that the solidification processes are is, rapidly solidif is rapid solidification. We get a cooling rate that is about 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 kelvins per second. So that's 10,000 K per second. The thermal gradients in our structures are about 10 to the 6 kelvin per meter, which would mean that where I am here is absolute zero, and the edge of the stage is the temperature of the sun. That's the kind of gradients we're putting in our materials, and we kind of worry, wonder why they don't like it very much. And what he went away and did was he looked to see whether he could change the chemistry to change the cracking susceptibility. And the truth of the matter is, and to have a look to see if we had any segregation. No segregation. These are atomic profiles. These are looking to see where the atoms are. And those are all of our different atoms. We're trying to look to see if across that crack there was any kind of segregation. No segregation present. And what he did, we had a look. Each element has an effect on the mechanical strength of your solid solution. And they all have a tiny little contribution that adds to make the UTS higher. And you can look inside of your alloy composition, and you can say, what makes it worse, what doesn't do very much, and what would make it really good? And the thing that we did was we pulled out all of the allowables that were rubbish, didn't do very much, and we maximized the allowables that did great things. So molybdenum is a huge solid solution strengthener, and so is tungsten. So we changed the alloy composition to maximize those two inside of the compositional allowance that the current structure, for the current composition for Hastelloy X allows you to use in aerospace. So this is exactly inside of the allowables. What's the result? Well, it doesn't get rid of them all together, but it certainly reduces them. And we have to remember that it's not the only trick in the book. It's not the only lever we have to pull. Because if you remember, we can change the bed temperature. We can change all sorts of other things. And if we can change that temperature, we can reduce the stress. So we can start to play tunes with our material and to actually think about the interaction of the process and the material to give you a composition that is suitable for the process. So that we can do it. And you can do it without having to do any crazy new alloying strategies. Having said that, I'm a university professor. That's my job. And so I do do crazy new alloy compositions. But if I just summarize, so I've only got 15 seconds left. It's a lovely clock here, by the way. It's very good. Um, if you define the characteristics of your process, you, that's great, because that helps you to understand what you're going to put on it and what's going to happen when you do. If you identify and exploit known physical phenomena and processes, you're in the right position to make a difference in terms of developing a new material. Looking, before, looking beyond your obvious will allow you to think about the unprocessable. 
right? So looking beyond the obvious and thinking, if I deconstruct my alloy, can I make it then? And the answer in our case was, yes, you can. And if you combine your modeling, you have to combine your theory and experiment and your modeling if you're going to get anywhere to do it at all. And uh, that just thanks to the group. And then, of course, I've got a, a, a soup of logos. I have to thank GK and Aerospace, who are very supportive. Rolls-Royce as well. Illica are a company that we work with on novel alloy development. And we've got an ATI project with them, an Aerospace Technology Institute project called Self-Healing Alloys for Performance Engineering. So if I can talk about that in a few years' time, that'll be very interesting. And um, being a, a, having a PhD and therefore being a philosopher, apparently, I like to finish with a philosopher. And my favorite philosopher is Marx. And as he says, these are my principles. And if you do not like them, I have others. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.